The COVID pandemic, like all crises, has revealed problems with the system. Our system of education isn't working that well because the pandemic has revealed that remote learning isn't working. And the reason it's not working is that teachers are relying on old learning management technology and video conferencing to transfer the traditional face-to-face -face model to the online world, and it's just not working very effectively. There is a better way. In this week's discussion, we're gonna explore helping learners to become autodidactic and to learn how to learn is a much better way than to continue doing what we've been doing for the past while. In our discussion today, we're gonna to be taking a look at a recent article that points out a problem that is a repetitive problem that just doesn't seem to go away. And that's a notion that Educational technology doesn't really transform the educational system. It doesn't work on its own. And the reason that it doesn't work is that we often use it as a quick fix. But I think the problem is a little bit deeper than that. And I want to point to an article that I read recently entitled A Failure to Disrupt Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education by Justin Reich of MIT. And he made the argument that the recent challenges we're facing with this COVID dilemma can be attributed to the fact that we are relying on an old style of technology from 30 years ago and older to replicate the problems of a face-to-face -face environment. And mm -hmm. unless we change what we're doing and focus on more significant things, we're gonna continue to have the limitations that we're seeing with the remote learning problems that we're seeing as a result of the COVID situation. So one of the challenges that we face or one of the opportunities that we see with something like COVID is whenever you run into difficulty or a problem or a crisis, it points out what foundational limitations are there in the system. So what are those foundational limitations? This is where we're going today. This is where we're going today. Any thoughts on that before I jump in? Yeah, I feel that we sometimes have a hyper like laser focus on the technology itself instead of the things that it can do to support learning. And I think that's one of the, when you talk about some of the foundational issues, we have, our, our attention is maybe not quite on the right things. And I, I would love to discuss this with you further today to get more insight into how we can shift our focus a little bit and how we can make the technology that's available to us um, not so so we're not so reliant upon it, um, that it, that it's there and we use it for learning, but it's not something that we are hyper-focused on in and of itself. And this is something we too deal with in our graduate program. You know, sometimes we'll have folks who come up with really great ideas, but they're, they're you know, I'm focused on an app or I'm focused on changing um, the system using the technology, but that doesn't really work. Change starts with us, right? So we have to shift our thinking a bit to to allow for those other things to fall into place that we so need in our educational system today. Well, I, I think you've touched on some key things and, and, and we're gonna talk about some of these ideas and I, I just wanna set the, the foundation. So Reich makes the argument that in, in order to see how technology really works, you have to take a look at how does the technology control the experience for the learner? Who's in control? Okay, so if you take a look at, at technology that controls the learner experience, well, it's something like the learning management system and Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. We put stuff up that students can access and we control the environment in a Zoom session or a Skype session or uh, whatever uh, session that we're using. So that, that is centered on the teacher control. If we don't do that, we then use uh, algorithm-based tools but unfortunately, those algorithm-based tools are only useful in math and some of the languages, and they're very, very limited. They, they, you know, they, they hold a lot of promise, but the reality is they're not very well developed, and they do really well in very, very small uh, places and small windows of opportunity, but they really don't work well across the whole system. And then the last area is that um, technology tools then can be used for peer-guided network-based learning. Uh, the challenge we face with that, though, is that we really don't do a good job in using peer-guided network 
evidence-based tools because for the most part, we ask the students to put them away in our classes. Don't, don't use all these networking mm -hmm. tools that everybody uses in the world around us. So, you know, the, the, a lot of the technology tools that we have really don't work. And, and what we end up doing is falling into, and what we have, if we were to take a look at, at the whole COVID situation, is we're using learning management systems that were first proposed in the 70s and 80s, and they came into fruition in the 90s. I started using my first learning management system in the early 90s, and they really haven't grown much more beyond that. And then we're also using telephony systems. We now call them video conferencing systems like Zoom or Skype. And guess what? Those systems go back to the 30s and 40s. So the technology that we're using to deal with the COVID situation is old technology. Now, people like myself and people like you who've been teaching online for a long time, and I've been teaching online a little bit longer, um, you know, I've been using this technology for many, many years, and it's easy for me to make it work effectively, but ironically, most people haven't. And so they, they're struggling to learn how to use these old systems. But these old systems are very, very limited. And, and the reason that they're limited is that they're missing the key point of education. Before we talk about this key point, do you want any comments, any ideas? Yeah, I, thinking back to even my own high school experience, we, you know, we would go to the computer lab and, you know, you've got to do this program, this pace, this sequence, things are very linear, you know, even in, in coming into college and getting used to some of the older systems, you know, talk about Microsoft Word and some of those things, they are very structured. You click this button, it does this and click this button, it does that. It's not that new, but I, I guess my, my thought is we've become over time so reliant when i talked about hyper focus on tech we've become reliant on these systems the instructor guided systems and how the teacher tells the the student exactly what and how to do it um and and then they they kind of control that learning if you will but the, the you know the the algorithm or the system or the the the, the you know whatever they're working on the content management system is telling our learners how to do things even our teachers how to do things so much so that they're constrained into a box or a template and that leaves little room to experience some of the new wave of, of technologies for learning and, and experience different ways of doing things like on the online blended learning and 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 you know getting teachers to think outside the box and and go oh what if, what if i push this button how how does it how is this going to impact my learning environment and you know i want to to um, just really encourage this message that, you know, there, there are different ways to do things outside of relying on a system or a technology that you could actually use to support what you want to do and how you want to do things, right? So just hopefully we'll go down that path in this conversation. Yeah, we are. And I think that'll be a, a good transition for the next section. So Reich makes the argument that the learners who are successful in the current COVID environment are those learners who know how to learn. He refers to them as autodidacts. And so he makes the argument that autodidacts or people who know how to learn or know how to learn how to learn are comfortable doing self-paced instruction. And, and it really doesn't matter what they do. They're going to be successful because they're self-motivated and they're academically, academically prepared. They're able to do the work because they're usually motivated with a plan in mind and they, they don't have to wait for the instruction from the teacher. Mm -hmm. They're not dependent upon that, that, that constant direction and guidance, right? They have not bought into the self-dependency. They are self-learners. That's why they're called autodidacts, okay? So for autodidacts, the systems that we have available to us are limitless. They mm -hmm. can do anything that they want, right? Because they can actually thrive in any type of environment. Now, Reich points out the problem is most of our students, the vast majority, I'm, I'm quoting here, the vast majority of students need teachers to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of students need teachers to tell them what to do. So instructor self-guide paced online courses are great for autodidacts, but the vast majority of people can't do them because they've grown up in a system of education that has 
created a dependency. They have to yep. wait for the teacher to tell them what content, what information, what do they need to regurgitate? Is this gonna be on the test? They, they look to give you the information. Uh, you know, the whole information transfer model creates a dependency on learners. Now, in his article, Reich talks about a variety of other things and he points to the fact that there's sort of uh, four key you know, dilemmas that we face in terms of moving forward, but he doesn't offer any solutions to his problem. He's pointed out the fact that the problem we face is that most students are dependent upon teachers. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get into his dilemmas, I, do you agree with Reich on this? Are we missing anything? Is it that simple? So, you know, have we created a level of dependency in most of our learners? Is it that simple? Based on public ed experience when, you know, having taught different states, different levels with different students, different teachers, I have found such a heavy push towards teaching to the standards, standardized tests, making sure that when I'm evaluated, you know, that when my principal comes in and do my evaluation, that I have my objective posted, very rarely an outcome, more of an objective of this is what we'll learn. And the kids, of course, get this, had to recite that objective and know exactly what it was, even if they didn't know what it meant. <laughs> so my point is, if we are reliant on standards, unauthentic learning experiences, um, systems, if we're reliant on the technology, how can we ever build that intrinsic capacity to learn how to learn and get our kids to cross over that threshold to become autodidacts if we are consistently asking them, even in, implicitly, to depend on the system, like learner dependence, right? So if we keep doing those things and we keep modeling those things in the classroom and we keep um, asking our kids to go down this path of it's going to be on the test, it's going to be on that state standard, the STAR test or, or that FCAT test or that I-STEP test, whatever region you're from, there's different test names for whatever region you're from. If we keep going down that pathway, our kids then need to be told when they come to college or, or maybe they're gonna go into a vocational you know, future, how to do things. Tell me exactly what I need to do and how I need to do it. And then that, that mindset doesn't go away. It, it doesn't go away unless someone comes along and helps them under, you know, shift their thinking and their focus a little bit. So yes, it is that simple. And unfortunately, it's something that too many of us follow blindly and don't even realize that we've done this, right? I mean, it, it can even go back to our childhood. Must get that A. You know, one of the things I tell my daughter, did you do your best? Did you do your very best? Yes, mom. Did the teacher say you're doing your very best? Yes, mom. <laughs> when, it, when, when I know that, okay, we can move forward now. You know, it's not about getting that perfect grade, following that perfect recipe and, and, and you know, not making mistakes. Guess what? Mistakes, best way I learn. We talked about that this morning, uh, Dwayne. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. So, Reich is further pointing out that one of the challenges that we face is that we're using these old technologies, the learning management systems that were developed in the 90s, and sure, they're fancier and easier to use, but they're still very, very limited. Um, and and the, the video conferencing tools, and, and the best that we can do is recreate that control model of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And, and he's, he's making an argument that we face four dilemmas in, in, in education because of being trapped in this model. And the first dilemma he refers to as a curse of the familiar. So we, we only build what we're familiar with. And, and so I'm going to introduce uh, one of my favorite s models to beat up, and that's a SAMR model, this notion of, you know, we're, we're going to substitute, augment, and modify, and then, you know, uh, re reinvent mm -hmm. or recreate. Well, it, 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 the reason the SAMR model never works is that people get caught on the familiar. They get caught on simply replicating mm -hmm. or substituting the face-to-face -face stuff with the digital stuff. That's, we get stuck there. We might augment it a little bit, but that's where we get stuck. That's why the summer model never works. Um, and the research is very, very clear. It doesn't work. It's the curse of the familiar. So by recreating a digital worksheet, it's still a worksheet. That's the problem. It's still a worksheet. The second dilemma is um, what, what Reich refers to as the EdTech Matthew effect. 
And, and what he means by that is it's the digital divide. Here's a paradox. I, I've got a background in library and information science. Do you know the number one users of the library are those folks who don't need it. The people who use the library the most have got the highest level of income and the highest level of degrees. They're the people who don't need the library. Libraries were invented for people who didn't have access. And yet the people who use the access to the library are the ones who don't need it. So we, we've got this digital divide. And, and guess what? We're seeing that because if you don't have the device, if you don't have the infrastructure, if you don't have the Wi-Fi, the online replication of, uh, of the face-to-face -face classroom is going to work. So we're seeing that, that EdTech Matthew effect. The third dilemma is the trap of routine assessment. Okay, so you know, we've, we've got this model of education where you've got the information transfer, you give it to the learner, the learner then gives it back to you, and you can assess that in a very routine way, and you can actually digitize that and, and, mod and, and augment it, and maybe even automate it through a learning management system, but it's still rudimentary. We're still, we're still asking basic information that you could Google and, and getting students to regurgitate mm -hmm. what they could Google. So it, it doesn't really help them learn. Just because they can recite information doesn't mean it's working. Mm -hmm. So that's the third dilemma is that right now our technology, really that's the best feedback it can give. And then the last dilemma that he points to is that we've got caught up in this notion of data being powerful. We, 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 we want to, the more data we have, the more information that a system has on us, the better the system will be able to give us what we need. And so we feed the algorithm with, with so much information about ourselves. And he cautions the fact that when we go down this path, we're giving up rights, freedoms, privacy for this hope of a system being able to tell us and give us feedback that we need. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really work that way. So these are the four dilemmas that we're facing. Now, Reich doesn't offer any solutions to this problem, but I think we have a solution to the problem. Do you want me to jump into the solution or do you want to comment on the yeah. dilemmas before I, 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 I spill the beans about what the solution is? Spill the beans, I can't wait, go for it. Okay. <laughs> so if autodidacts, if people who know how to learn how to learn can handle any type of a learning environment, any type of a situation, and since most of the students who are out there are dependent upon teacher instruction, what if we helped more and more of our students learn how to learn? It might just work. What if we focused on helping all learners learn how to learn? What if we focused on helping all learners continue to be the autodidacts that they actually were when they were young children? Mm -hmm. If you watch an infant, if you watch a toddler, if you watch a child, if you watch a young child before they go into kindergarten, or even in kindergarten grade one, they're autodidactic. They're going for it. They're experimenting. They're testing everything. They know how to learn how to learn because that's their life. Why is the sky blue? Why does that happen? How does this work? Why, 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 why? They're asking all those amazing, wonderful questions because they want to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to our original notion of the learner's mindset. So mm -hmm. rather than you know, move a learner to the growth mindset after we've taken that away from them, if we encourage young learners to continue to be the autodidacts that they are and help them to continue to learn how to learn, then guess what? They will be able to handle any type of a situation and we wouldn't be mm -hmm. facing this problem. Now, we do have a system for this. All we have to do is create that significant learning environment where you give your learner choice, ownership, and voice through authentic learning opportunities, and they'll be able to handle the real world. And, and as you and I have been talking about for many years now, by doing this, we help them to be learners who know how to learn how to learn and to continue to grow and to continue to experiment. We are preparing them not just for the test, but for their future lives. And as Reich would argue in his article here, autodidacts can handle any type of a system and they'll be able to face the challenges that we're facing. But we face a challenge in terms of shifting our educational system from the traditional information transfer model of creating a dependency on, on the learner and on the teacher to this model of choice, ownership, and voice through authentic learning coaching and mentoring, mm -hmm. you know, as educators, we have to shift from being control oriented task managers of information transfer to guides, to coaches, to mentors. Mm -hmm. So we have a system, we have a solution. The challenge is, is implementing the solution. So what are your thoughts on my solution to the problem? 
I'm glad you went down the path of creating significant learning environments that offer choice, ownership, and voice through authentic learning. My thought was to say that, but you did. So that's great. But the, the piece I think that I took from what you were sharing, you said autodidacts can handle the system, any system. It wasn't the other way around, right? So we can't rely on a system to give us control of our learning and give us an opportunity to experiment and ha have a choice and, and take ownership of we're learning if we're if we're just walking through those steps if we're following that algorithm if we're following that guide or that learning management or content management system we can't get where we need to become to learn how to learn if we're consistently stuck to a system so the key words and everything that you said was that autodidacts manage a system right so the, they are the ones controlling the system. The system's not controlling them. And that is where I think everything, that when I talk about that shift in focus, when we experience that, all of a sudden now, <laughs> you're not gonna get me back onto a system anymore. Okay, yeah, I might go to a system, Rosetta Stone and learn some Spanish, you know, that, that's okay. That, that, that works really, really great in that area, but you're not going to get me to build my own science experiment based on some sort of system. Now, my, my son the other day, last week, he's, he's five, and he says, Mom, I don't think I want to be an engineer anymore. And I'm like, uh-oh, because he's all excited about building and creating. He goes, I think I want to be a scientist. I said, but Micah, I said, you can, have, you can be both. He says, Mom, do you mean I can be an engineer who's a scientist? Well, that's what I want to be. I don't ever want him to, to leave that, that inquisitive nature that he has because he's already a control freak, right? <laughs> His little five-year-old body. He takes Legos and he builds houses and boat houses and beach cabins and all these other things and puts them all together. I don't ever want him to lose that at five, that imagination, that, inqu that inquisitivism, that excitement for life and learning um, that he has. So I think that I have to step back and allow him to continue to grow and build on that. Otherwise, he could become one of those people who are uh, a follower of the system or, or you know, I'm going to follow this to get where I want to be. It, now, we have to do that in certain ways. We have to learn some things. We have to learn how to, you know, follow directions and instructions. Th that's okay. But let's not squash that, 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 that desire, that innate um, wanting to learn how to learn on their, in their own way and experiment and make, it, you know, errors and, and, and fail forward. So I think, um, yeah, this is great. This is a really great conversation and you touched on some, some key points, so. Now, here's the big challenge. We've come up with the solution, the learner's mindset, create those significant learning environments, give your learner choice, ownership, and voice. But how do you do that? How do you do that when the system of education around us is focused on content delivery? How do you do that? Now, we're experiencing that in the DLL program where a lot of our learners come in and they build an innovation plan, but they face this challenge very quickly where they realize that the system that they're in is going to fight them at every step in every way mm -hmm. because it's well entrenched. We have the rhetoric and language of Dewey. We talk about progressive education. We talk about learner-centered education. We talk about mm -hmm. individualized instruction. We talk about all those wonderful things, but yet we still require all this ridiculous testing. You, you were sharing with me the other day how your daughter, who's just a couple years older than your son, is already starting to feel a little bit ill on Fridays because yep. she's got all these tests that she has to do in grade one. Or yep. is it grade two? Is it grade one? So, grade one, she has seven to nine tests yeah, per um, week. So we start them off early and, and guess what? Mm -hmm. it, it won't take long for the system of education to teach your daughter to do this, is this gonna be on the test? It, it doesn't mm -hmm. take long for kids to realize this is how it works, mm -hmm. that it, this isn't about learning, this is about giving you the information to verify mm -hmm. that I've addressed I've your objectives and your standards because I've mm -hmm. got some star test or I've got some other you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, formal credentialing exam that I have to pass to show that the system of education has delivered me the content and that I have mm -hmm. checked off that box. So how, how do we deal with that? Well. We're doing it in the DLL program. We're doing it mm -hmm. in, in our learner's mindset, um, uh, professional learning environments. We're doing it. You and I are doing it ourselves. And I, I would argue that we need to continue doing something that I hold on to as a bit of my notorious scheme. And that is trying to change the world one learner at a time. 
And, and the reason that I've recognized that is that over the years, I've been in the system of education, fighting the system of education. And I've worked at different levels, right from a senior administrator to you know, a faculty member. And I've realized that my biggest impact is with the one learner at a time. Mm -hmm. If I can change the world for one learner, and if I can help them to become that learner who can learn how to learn, once they embrace that, once they go down that path, they can then deal with the system of education in the same way that you and I are dealing with the system of education. If you were to take a look at my history and my story, the system of education failed me, but I survived because I've always been a learner who can learn on his own. I've been, I'm a bit of a rebel too. I'm a bit of a, you know, a, a crap disturber. So I, I survived partially <laughs> because of that as well. But I've always been a person who explored, who experimented. I, I was like your son. I'm an engineer. I'm a scientist. I never stop asking why. Mm -hmm. And so if we can inspire, encourage one learner at a time to do that, it'll make all the difference in the world. Now, here's a key. If we choose to inspire those learners who happen to be teachers, and if we can give them a taste and change their world and get them to recognize that through choice, ownership, and voice and authentic learning opportunities, they too can create a learning environment that they can give their learners that choice, ownership, and voice. They too can create those authentic learning opportunities in that learning environment that will then change that world for that one learner. Mm -hmm. So if we do it one learner at a time, um, I, I think we can make a big difference. Um, and, and guess what? You change a few teachers here and there, it, it, and they'll two, tell two friends and so on, and they'll tell two friends mm -hmm. and so on. I think there's, there's power at that grassroots level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this doesn't really have to abort or disrupt everything that they're doing. It, it can be, you know, slowly worked in and weaved into how you're doing things. If you take a look at what you're teaching or what you're sharing, what, how your kids are responding, how could I just take this idea and maybe turn it this way a little bit and make it a bit more authentic and real world for my kids? Um, than just teaching to that objective or teaching to that test. And I think one thing that I, that my daughter, you know, is coming to understand is that she has plenty of outside of school, real life, authentic experiences, building a garden. Uh, we have, we have chickens and rabbits in, in the back and she's getting a lot of those real life experiences outside of school. And I talk with her about how these these concepts that she's learning in school do do help uh, you know apply to her bigger world and her bigger picture in her world but also helping her interpret what that is so, so not a, not every kid has that advantage right so we do need teachers to help bridge those connections for those kids who are you know maybe struggling a little bit or maybe there is such a heavy emphasis or focus on i'm a, a you know a, a, a school in needs of improvement or title one school you can still make those bigger broader connections with your kids if you give them, them the opportunity to share that with you what and that can be informally done it doesn't mean disrupting or uh, aborting everything that you already do it means working in those opportunities when the opportunity is there right and and, and sometimes it is a matter of just sitting and talking with your kids and building those relationships. Building those relationships is one of the most important things you can do so that they can then relate what you're talking about and what you're instructing um, to, their, to their world. And again, going back to this notion, your sinister notion of changing the world one learner at a time, it's ours, it's become ours. Um, but it, it does take that, that step in that maybe a little bit of an uncomfortable direction just to, to help those kids focus on life and you know, not just what am I learning for a test? Uh, I'm glad you emphasize the fact that we don't have to throw out everything and that we can mm -hmm. do a little change in focus. We can shift our attention by incorporating a project, even mm -hmm. in, in a school that is disadvantaged, by incorporating mm -hmm. project-based learning, by incorporating mm -hmm. relationship building, by shifting mm -hmm. from a role of being a, a, a control teacher to a coach, a guide, a mentor. Mm -hmm. You can change the focus enough to bring in real world learning opportunities for those mm -hmm. students who might not have the benefit that your son and daughter have, mm -hmm. right? So your son and daughter have the benefit of, of you and your husband mm -hmm. who have created a learning environment in your home that will equip them for the future. And so I think it's really a matter of changing that focus 
And sometimes all it takes is stepping back and look at mm -hmm. the bigger project. Where does mm -hmm. this fit in? Uh, whether it's going to be a blended learning initiative, a one-to-one -one initiative, maybe an e-portfolio initiative, maybe it's computational thinking, robotics, whatever. If you can incorporate some type mm -hmm. of a project that has a real-world component, mm -hmm. learning about the world around you, you know, in history, learning about the history that is down the street in the old age home, as opposed to reading about it in a book, having students interview mm -hmm. uh, seniors that are in the neighborhood or maybe even seniors that they are related to there's so many little opportunities that we have that we can actually m modify from information transfer and content delivery to having learners and explore investigate and look at how does this make meaning in my life help them to make those meaningful connections so i guess all we're really asking teachers to do is step back a little bit change the focus right mm -hmm. recognize that we we're never going to get out of the system of education you and i are both in it we're part of it but guess what? We do have a fair amount of control what we do in our classrooms. And if we change our focus, if we shift our focus from content delivery to authentic learning, authentic learning opportunities, if we give our learners choice, ownership, and voice through those authentic learning opportunities, we are preparing them mm -hmm. to learn how to learn. And, and we are addressing Reich's challenge. And that is, right now, ed tech isn't working. The reason ed tech isn't working is because all the best that we're doing is using those old learning management systems and old video conferencing tools to control the learning environment. If we shift from that and use synchronous collaboration to engage, to build relationships, to bring people together, and we use the asynchronous component of the learning management systems to prepare and equip the learner to go deeper, and then the learner builds their own projects, and they trust us as a coach and a guide and as a mentor, it's going to change everything. Mm -hmm. So we actually don't even have to stop using these tools. We just have to use these tools a little bit different, differently, more effectively. Shift from content delivery to relationship building, to communication, to actual genuine collaboration, mm -hmm. and just give the learner the opportunity to learn how to learn as opposed to transfer information. That's the solution. Reich never positive the solution but we have it it's called the learner's mindset if you prepare learners to do this to actually look at every opportunity or every challenge as an opportunity for growth mm -hmm. then the world becomes this enormous world of opportunity there's so much that can be done and who knows what our learners will be able to accomplish if we equip them to be those lifelong learners lots of potential here lots of potential okay so I want to end on this note that if we do this well, and actually we don't even have to do it well, we, we can still fumble through this because <laughs> it's part of the learning process. If we can give our learners that choice, ownership, and voice, create those learning opportunities, the world is going to be that much bigger, that much more powerful, and the potential that they have to make a difference in their world and everyone else's is going to be off the charts. Enormous potential if we just make this little shift away from content delivery to authentic learning opportunities and helping the learner to learn how to learn, the sky's the limit.